This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. The same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the path that got me from UCSB to Blizzard, and also to let you know that it's okay to follow your passions, even if it doesn't lead you down the road that you originally planned and anticipated. As a matter of fact, you'll see when I get to the Blizzard section that um, that particular approach drives Blizzard in many of the things that we do. Actually, the ability to change course over time is what allows the best companies, in my opinion, to last the test of time. So the first section that I'm going to talk about is the UCSB years, and although I'm not going to do this for every section, I want to tell you what I, I named this section, because I think that you'll find it amusing, especially the students. I called this Part 1, the UCSB years, How to, Not Taking Calculus 3B Helped Me to Get Where I Am Today. <laughs> so <laughs> anyhow, I transferred to UCSB as a junior in the fall of 1990 from a junior college in my hometown of Ventura. And I had known that I wanted to come to UCSB since I was a sophomore in high school. So actually, um, it wasn't an issue of grades. It was an issue that I was going to be paying for my college. And so it was part of my plan. I wanted to do the junior college route to get all my general education stuff out of the way and to be able to um, do the pre-major stuff there so that I'd minimize the number of college loans I'd have. And I thought that that would be a good approach. You'll find as I talk that I always have some kind of plan in place. Um, the other thing is, is that in, in addition to wanting to be frugal, I also thought, based upon how I was operating when I came out of high school, that I might get a little distracted in IV. And, um, and so I thought waiting until I was a junior would be better for me. I'm guessing maybe one or two of you can relate to that. I don't know. Um, so anyway, I came here um, with the intention of getting a business economics degree, as I think many of you in the audience today are doing. But I always looked at it as kind of a fallback type of opportunity for me because I had this bigger goal that I was looking to, uh, to pursue. And that was I was planning to finish up here with my business economics degree and to then go on to UCLA and focus on architecture. It's a big difference from what I decided to do ultimately. Um, but it was, uh, it was one of those things where when I got here, there were certain things that occurred that caused me to take a different path. And, um, I thought I was going to pursue one of my main passions, which was designing houses, but I ended up following a different passion, which was playing games, um, although I had no idea at the time that that could be a career path for me. So when I arrived in 1990, I had a couple of pre-major classes that I needed to knock off before getting started in my upper division econ classes. And unfortunately, calculus 3A and 3B were those two that I needed to get done. And candidly, I kind of procrastinated on those because I hated calculus, to be honest, and I um, thought, well, I guess I'll get to it when I get to Santa Barbara. Hopefully it'll not be as bad there as it is where I'm at right now. Um, so I started 3A and I was hating my life and, uh, and I decided that I was going to try to find an alternative solution for 3B and I found out about this class uh, called uh, Writing 109, which at the time, and I don't know if it still works this way, but it was uh, a solution you could take to avoid taking 3B. That's the way I looked at it. That's probably not the way that everybody here in the administration wants it to be looked at, but that's what I looked at it like. Um, and so I did that, and it was that class, that choice, that was the, the, the impetus for the change in my direction. And let me tell you a little bit about that. Um, and upon, upon arrival to that writing class, first of all, I was a, a transfer student, and so I didn't know a lot of folks, and the professor said we were going to be working on a writing assignment that was going to span the entirety of the quarter, and we were going to focus on building a business plan. 
And so, as I'm sure many of you have experienced, I got, uh, I, I looked around and I didn't see any of my friends, and so I ended up just picking some randoms in front of me. And the, uh, one of the people I met was a woman by the name of Ingrid Bohm. And Ingrid had uh, been a UCSB student and had, had left for a while to be able to raise a family, and so she was coming back to finish up her last few classes. And so she and I ended up uh, getting together to work on this project with a couple of other people that didn't participate and got the be helped get the best grade on the, on the uh, project from the two of our work. Again, I don't know if you guys have experienced that before, but I know that I did um, in this case. So anyway, um, she and I worked on this, this project uh, end with endless amounts of effort because we really wanted to do well, and it was actually working on a project that both of us were really excited about and had a good, were having a good time with. And um, that, all that work resulted in us getting the top two grades in that class. And it was the first time that she'd ever had a class that she really loved that she didn't get the top grade, because I did. And that's probably the only time in this conversation I'm going to say anything quite like that that sounds like um, being arrogant, because I think that might have been the only time that happened for me. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, um, she, uh, she and I became friends, and she ended up offering me a job. Um, as I mentioned, she had come back to school, and her family owned a company called ABC Clio, which is just uh, a, a local reference, library reference book company here that's actually one of the largest in the world. And they um, hired me on as an intern to be uh, a person that would do technical writing. And it was those technical writing efforts that I learned in that class that, that helped me get there. And so I was hired to write the accounting procedures manual and their human resources procedures manual. And uh, working there at ABC Clio and their s subsidiary in telemation over the next three years was one of the best training grounds that I ever had in my career. And the reason for that is, is because they had me operate in a way that I kind of refer to as a firefighter. And what that was, was I would end up going around the company wherever the, wherever the management needed me and help fill holes where there were problems. And so I was exposed to almost every aspect of the business. And I think a lot of times when we get jobs, we end up focusing a lot on a particular subject. You know, maybe we do accounting and we work in an, and we're doing a, we're doing different financial reports and what have you, but it's more narrow. And what was great about this opportunity for me was I was able to see all the little nuances of all the different departments. So I, I worked in accounts receivable and accounts payable. I worked in author royalty administration, direct sales, software manual layouts, as well as shipping and receiving, HR, QA, you name it, and I did it at the company. And um, they found that I was very versatile, and as a result, they gave me a lot of opportunities to do those things. If someone went on maternity leave, well, let's get Paul to do it. If someone uh, left the company and there was a need, they'd say, oh, let's have Paul do it. And it was because I was willing to do anything, no matter how big or how small, to succeed. And that's something that you'll hear throughout my conversation today with you, is that you need to be willing to do anything, no matter how big or how small at the company you work with, because that says something about you and the kind of employee you are and <clears throat> how you will be able to impact the company. And so, <clears throat> as I mentioned, I gained a lot of exposure and I gained a lot of fans in the company and there was a number of the senior people that served as mentors to me and took me under their wing so that I could better understand the things that I was experiencing. People like Ingrid and, and Ron Bohm, who was the CEO, and a woman by the name of Becky Snyder and Charles Batsford, all these folks still live locally, and they're the folks that had some of the biggest influences on me uh, during this chapter of my journey. Specifically, um, the learnings I gained from the, the boss there, Ron, uh, related to contract administration, contract drafting, as well as a little bit of negotiation with their software authors and developers, was really instrumental for me in preparing me for my first career move. One of the other key learnings, and I talked about this a little bit already, but I just want to reiterate it. I, I got this from Charlie Batsford, and he taught me that no matter how big or how small the task was, that they all needed to get done, and that you had to roll up your sleeves and do the work regardless of how big or small the task was, that that was a key element of becoming a great leader, that you never asked people to do things that you were unwilling to do yourself, that you had to lead from the front. So this was something that I wanted to make sure if anything that you got to, from today is that you be mindful of that as you enter the job, the job force. Um, that 
if you take this approach, it will be a key differentiator for you as you navigate your career. You'll get noticed more because most people, you know, if they get in some place, they tend to, if, they, if things aren't going the way they want, they start complaining. Those are the people that don't really progress. It's the people that put their head down and get it done, and they don't care how big or small it is. So that was something that I learned, and I, I hope that you guys walk away today hearing that, because I think a lot of times we think, oh, well, we're so smart, or, and you know, that particular subject or that particular thing is beneath me. There's this other person that would be more appropriate for. Give me the big stuff. And you know what? You'll get the big stuff, but it's, it's really an issue of being willing to do whatever to get there. So in case you didn't notice, I'd kind of fallen in love with um, business and specifically software in the games industry. And it was starting to look like architecture wasn't in my future, which leads me to the second chapter of, of this journey that I had. And that was Davidson and Associates. Um, <clears throat> as I said, I had a great experience at Intellimation, but I reached a point where I felt like I really needed to move on and truly begin my career. So I began a job search, and I started looking in the classified section of a newspaper. A newspaper, I know that that, I don't know if you guys have heard of those before, um, but uh, we kind of look at the, the internet a lot now, but back then, which doesn't seem so long ago for me, but I guess it was quite a long time ago, um, that's the way that you looked for jobs. And so I did that, and um, to my surprise, the first weekend I started looking, I came upon a job advertisement for a contract administrator position at Davidson & Associates. You remember when I was at Intellimation, Ron, the CEO, who was a lawyer, kind of took me under his wing and taught me all about that kind of stuff. And so I thought, wow, um, Davidson Associates, I know, I know these people. I've, been, I've seen them at, at trade shows when I've represented Intellimation. I've always been impressed by them. And candidly, I was excited about the prospect of uh, being able to apply for a position that I thought was really up my alley. And it was with a company that was really respected in that market. They were one of the leaders in the world in educational software. So um, I basically uh, went after that job because I also wanted a raise. I, if I was to get that job, I was going to really, really have a fat salary. I was going to go up to $32,000 a year if I was able to get that. That was in 94. So anyway, um, I was confident, and I believed I could do anything. So it was no surprise to me that they called me back within a couple of days of getting my resume, and I went down there for an interview, and I ended up uh, speaking with the director of HR, the controller, and the CFO of a publicly traded NASDAQ company. And I think when I, when I think about that now, it, it, it continues to surprise me that that level of people were interviewing this, this kid at a school that was coming in for what I perceived to be a rather entry-level job. And um, once I got there and I started talking to them, I realized that that was really what they were all about. They looked at every new hire as a new family member, and they took it really seriously. And so I interviewed well and convinced them that I was the right person for the job and that I had the requisite capability to do it. And uh, one of the things that I, I want to point out now, which will come, a little bit, come to, to bear a little bit later, is when they interviewed me, they said, you know, when, you're, when you are uh, looking at your future, what do you think that's going to look like in five years? You know, that's a typical interview question. Well, I did the big, bold thing, and I said to them, well... I'm going to be a vice president of your company in five years. And I thought that was a bold statement to make, and I thought, well, geez, that might get me booted out of there. But that was the first thing that came to my mind because I was that confident. I felt so confident in my experience at UCSB, the, the insights and the learnings I got from my professors here who were excellent. And I also felt like I got a great bit of learnings at ABC Clio and Intellimation. Those, that, those handful of years were some of the years where I gained my most uh, strong influences. And so anyway, um, as you might imagine, they hired me, and, uh, and I was hired at 23. And they had me report to the chief financial officer of the company. Again, this $32,000 job, for God knows why, they had me reporting to him. And um, I'm glad they did, because it gave me the opportunity to get noticed. And um, so they brought me in, and I started, I, I was going to be uh, responsible for over, overseeing all of the contracts for the company and to make sure that we and our partners were complying with all the contracts. And so I set out to read all of them. And one of the key things I did uh, during that uh, review process was I created a database, which was totally unheard of at the time that you would do that on a computer, and I t pulled all the best clauses from those agreements. And I don't know really today why I did that, although that was something that really 
again, there's these things that you do, these little itty bitty things that really made a difference um, for me. And uh, the reason for that is, is that I uh, was there for about a month and a person by the name of Jody Honore came to me. She was in charge of, uh, of the licensed product business. And she uh, said, you know, I have a real issue. And that is, I need, to get a new, I need to get a license agreement for this potential partner. And our contract sucks. And this partner is being sought after by all of our competitors. It's going to be a huge business for us. It's millions of dollars to the company. And I need some help. And I said, well... I'm just a contract administrator. I, I, I'd love to help you, um, but I assume you just mean you want me to put all of their, the company's specific information into our boilerplate agreement and go from there, right? And they said, no, no, I, I need a contract, and I need you to help me. I said, well, I'm not a lawyer. I, I can't write you a contract. Now, meanwhile, in my head, I'm thinking, I can write you a contract because I'm a kid, right? I'm 23 years old, and I'm thinking, I can do anything. This is the way I viewed things, and I thought, I have... I have this experience, you know, for a short window of time at Intel Nation, I thought, I could do this. And so she said, you know, I really need your help. It would be a big help to me, and it would be a big thing for the company if we could land this. Can you, can you do it? And I said, you know what? Um, I will under one circumstance, and that is you have to make sure that you take it to the CEO and have him review it, because he was the only guy that was a lawyer, although he wasn't practicing. I was afraid that if I did this type of thing, for a public company, by the way, that I could get fired if I did this because I was like, geez, I, if, I, if I do this kind of thing, um, it's rather risky. What, what knowledge do I have to be able to do this? Well, the person said, okay, I'll do it. Um, and they said, but I need it tomorrow. <laughs> I said, I need it. you need it tomorrow? Well, uh, okay. So I did something that um, I learned here. And it was one of the greatest things that I learned here. And I know that all of you are training on this today. And that is I pulled an all-nighter. Um, and uh, you guys might have experienced that for a midterm or two or for a final. But I, I basically um, took all those clauses from the agreements. Remember how I said a little earlier that I, when I was going and reading the hundreds of agreements that the company had, that I would... I pulled all the best ones from all the different types of agreements, and so I took those home with me that night. First of all, I stayed late at the office, and then I took them home with me, and I worked throughout the night. I read it and reread it and read it and reread it and made sure that it was perfect. I integrated all the business terms from the term sheet that the, that the uh, director had given me, and I walked in the following morning and I said, okay, here it is. Don't forget we had the commitment that we made to each other. You've got to take it to Bob Davidson, who was the CEO. And she said, okay, um, wow, this is really fast. I thought, you were, I, told you, I thought you were gonna get it to me by the end of the day today. And I was like, oh, I guess we miscommunicated. So anyway, um, <laughs> geez, I didn't have to stay up all night. So anyway, um, I gave that to her and uh, she came back to me at the end of the day and she said, you know, listen, you saved me. I, I got it out to the partner. I said, how could you have had it out to the partner? You were supposed to get it to Bob Davidson. And she says, well, I did. And I said, he let it go by its, just as is? She goes, yeah. As a matter of fact, he said it was one of the best contracts he's ever read. And what's interesting about that for me was, was that for this publicly traded company, over the next year and change, I wrote 80% of the contracts. And I didn't have any formal training, but it was something that I really loved, and I had learned it in Telemation, the job that I got as a result of meeting this woman in the writing class that I was taking to avoid calculus. And so um, <laughs> anyway, um, it really was a big, a big thing for me. And it really set me apart. And it was, again, an example of being willing to do anything, no matter how hard or how easy, how big or how small. It was me saying, I'll do it. I put my hand in the air. I'll take the, I'll take the chance. And it was something that Bob Davidson remembered um, for a long, long time about me. And it was one of the things that impacted his decision to come to me and ask me to take on a new challenge. And at this point, I'm about 24 years old, and he came to me and he said, listen, I need to talk to you, and I, I really feel like you've been doing great things for the company, but there's something else that I think you could make a bigger difference for the company uh, on. And so I said, okay, Bob, uh, sure, you know. And I was like, Bob Davidson's coming to talk to me. And 
So we went to his office, he closed the door, and he said, listen, I, I have an opportunity that I want to put in front of you, and I, uh, I think it's, it's a big one, but it's one that I think that you can handle. Um, I'm not sure that anybody else is going to understand why I'm giving this opportunity to you. I mean, a lot of people know how, that you work hard, but you know, you're a young guy, and what I'd like you to do is a, is a pretty big project. And I said, okay, well, I'll do anything. You know that. And he goes, I know. That's one of the reasons why I'm, I've thought of you. You know, I, uh, I, you remind me of me when I was younger. And I said, okay, well, tell me what it is. And so he proceeded to tell me that he wanted me to run a $50 million joint venture at 24 years old. Um, and, it, and I got to tell you, to this day, it dry, my jaw drops because, I mean, why in the world he would see this 24-year-old kid being worthy of taking over a $50 million joint venture, serving as the general manager and as the chairman of the joint venture board? Um, it, it's one of those things that still surprises me to this day, but I understand why he did it, and I, and I asked him, you know, over the years why he chose to, and he, he told me because he thought that no matter how big or how small the issue, that I would handle it, and that I would carry the, the, the torch through, and I'd make sure that we succeeded. <clears throat> and he saw that in me because not only did I do anything, anything and everything, but he saw me there when he'd get there first thing in the morning. I was there when he'd get there. And at night when he'd leave, I'd be there. And he knew I would do anything and everything to make sure that we were successful. And we, and we were very successful. Um, we made uh, quite a bit of money in that, in that uh, joint venture. We were profitable the entire time that I ran it. And the operating margins were, were quite strong as well. And uh, it was in that role as the general manager of that joint venture that I again started getting the opportunity to interface with all sorts of different areas of the business. Because when you're building software products and you're overseeing the business associated with those software products in this joint venture, you're interfacing with people that are in marketing, in PR, in quality assurance, in the supply chain side of the business, and distribution, you're dealing with salespeople, you're dealing with this whole plethora of types of people and types of challenges. And again, because all of these people I was working with knew me because I'd been working with them on contracts, I had relationships, and I had their trust. And I wasn't cocky, I was just confident. And there's a big difference between the two. But I was confident, and they all saw how, saw how hard I'd work, and they knew how committed I was. And so those people that were senior executives in the company overseeing those different functions took me under their wing. And again, the reason they did was because I was willing to do anything. And so I got all that exposure, and we uh, launched four products while I was in charge of that joint venture. And uh, they all, a number of them um, were met with critical acclaim, and they all did really well for educational software standards. From a, they're not, not huge numbers compared to Blizzard numbers, but definitely big for educational software. And, um, and so, again, I was met with the situation where Bob Davidson strolled into my office. It was like deja vu. And he said to me, you know, you remember back when, when you uh, started with the company back in 94, um, you, uh, you did a lot of work um, doing due diligence for one of our acquisitions. I said, yeah, I remember. Um, I said, my favorite was when we did Silicon and Synapse. And he said, yeah, um, mine too. Silicon and Synapse, by the way, is the company that was original, was, is now Blizzard. And um, what not a lot of people know is, is that as m in my second week of work there, I did all the contractual due diligence for that acquisition. And again, it's going back to this, why in the world would they be looking at this young kid to do something that's that important? But again, for some reason, they saw something in me, and I, again, being willing to do all that is necessary. And <clears throat> um, so he came to me and he said, you know, it's interesting that you, that you uh, have such fond memories about that because that's what I want to talk to you about. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I'd like you to, to um, consider moving down to Irvine and overseeing um, the business at Blizzard. Um, the guys down there at Blizzard are game developers, and they're very smart guys. Um, they're very capable of doing all the business stuff, but candidly, they don't want to do that business monkey work. They don't want to make games. They want to focus on stuff that's cool. And uh, this stuff is, is not to them. And I said, well, it is to me. And I said, I'd love to do that. Um, however, I don't know if they'll take me. You know? um, I'm a gamer, but 
you know, these guys are a different level of gamer. They're, they're hardcore. And they, uh, and, and, and we're, and we just were very, very different. Um, uh, and so he, he told me about this and I thought to myself, you know, I, I really definitely want to go do this. And so I had one big hurdle to cross and that was I needed to interview with Alan Adham, the president and co-founder of Blizzard at the time. And he was known as the young badass at the company and he was the brilliant one and the one poised for world gaming domination. And so I wondered if he'd pick me. Um, and fortunately he did. So um, actually before I start chatting about Blizzard, um, why don't we take a look at the opening cinematic of our most recent product launch, uh, World of Warcraft, Wrath of the Lich King. My son, the day you were born, the very forests of Lordaeron whispered the name. Straight when exercising your great power. Stirring the hearts of your people. I tell you this, for when my days have come to an end, you shall be king. Serve my purpose, which was to make sure everybody was awake again. Um, wasn't sure how exciting that first part would be, so I figured that would be a good uh, way to break it up. So, anyway, um, been at Blizzard since August of 1996, and I started as the director of business development. And um, since that time, um, I have increased my responsibility. Um, to positions of greater uh, authority and, and responsibility, and it became the chief operating officer in 2005. Um, a quick note um, that I talked about earlier um, during that Davidson interview, um, in 1998, after only four years, I became vice president of the company, so that was a fun one for me to be able to talk with those people um, that interviewed me. But anyway, um, when I started with the company, we only had about 40 people, and the vast majority of the team was made up of game developers. 
I mean, at first, I struggled to fit in at the company, to be honest, because I like to take showers and um, wear shoes, and uh, I liked having a girlfriend also. So that was, that was definitely something that was different for the company. But um, the good news was that I, I, I love to play games, and that was a, a big commonality for me um, with the developers. And since uh, I was originally just, and since then, I guess, um, I've shed that uh, suit kind of moniker that they gave me. They thought I was going to come there from Davidson and take away all the fun, and I've built a lot of friends and a lot of trust and uh, only wear jackets to things like this now. Usually I wear t-shirts and jeans to work every day. So um, anyway, uh, became part of the management team soon after arriving there and um, helped to build the company from that 40 people to a company that today is about 3,500 people globally. Um, we have offices in California, which is where our global headquarters is, as well as in Texas, France, Ireland, China, Korea, Taiwan, and a number of little satellite offices um, around Europe as well. Um, and in my role as the chief operating officer, um, I oversee all the global business operations for the company. And um, you know, as I discussed earlier, the jobs that I had both up here in Santa Barbara during college and after as well as at Davidson Associates, those jobs prepared me to do this job. And I think that, that I had those experience, experiences because this was a place that I was uh, destined to land. It's the greatest company I can ever imagine working for, and it's something that I'm proud of every day to be a part of. And um, it's wonderful for me because I get to be a part of all these different aspects of the company that make a big difference. I, I don't have product development reporting to me, but I have influence on that. And, uh, but all the other areas that support it um, come to me. And so those, I think the uh, gentleman uh, in charge of economics gave you a list so I won't bore you with the list of items that, that uh, I'm responsible for. But what I'd like to do is stop talking about me, which I think is the boring part of the conversation, and talk a little bit about um, what it is that we've done at Blizzard to help set us up for the success that we found. Um, and uh, maybe to talk a little bit about what we do, the things that we do that I think are quite different than a lot of other companies that set us apart. Um, and I think with that, with that I, I'd like to focus on our core values at Blizzard because that's really where it all starts. Um, I think, you know, when you talk to your professors and you, and you talk to uh, different business people and they list the different things that they think of as, as the key values that a company should have, I think what you'll find is there's a couple here that uh, are ones that you might hear elsewhere, but ours are quite different. And this, I think, is a testament to the type of company we are, the fact that we're a game company and that we endeavor to make the best games in the world. And so there's eight of them, and they all support the mission of our company. And so the eight of them are gameplay first. Gameplay first because we are a game company, and that is the only reason we're doing this, is we want to make great games. And so all our decisions that we make are based upon gameplay and it being great. We also commit to quality. Um, that's the second one. And what, if you know Blizzard, you know that we do not ship games before they're done and that we want to make sure that they're the best and most polished games that you can find. The next one is play nice, pay, play fair. And what that is is for uh, all of the people in the company to work together and collaborate to achieve these goals and to be able to deliver epic experiences to people. The other one, and this is one I guarantee you no other company has, it's embrace your inner geek. <laughs> and, you know, when you're making games, you've got to be in tune with pop culture. You need to be in tune with what other gamers are into. And we want you to be geeky. We want you to have passions um, that support and influence you in ways that help you make better games. And so that's a big one for us. The other one is every voice matters. And, you know, you hear that at companies, but at Blizzard, I think it's really different. Every person in the company, as an example, is expected to play our games and to test our games and to make sure that they're ready for them to go to the customer. And so from the receptionist to the president, everybody's playing them when we're getting ready to go and, uh, and make sure that they, are, they have the what we call blizzard polish. The other one is think globally. That's one that I... Uh, hoped for when we were working uh, towards building the company up, but that's become big for us. We are the world leader in online games, and it's because many years ago we started focusing on delivering global launches and delivering global simultaneous launches and focusing on having all the localized versions done 
and being able to, to provide them uh, in a way that is appropriate for those markets. Also to lead responsibly because we are a leader in the industry and the things that we do influence other companies and other game developers and other uh, people that are working. And so we want to make sure that we do things that are right. We're very big on making sure to do right and to make the right decisions and to operate ethically and to do things that are for the betterment of our customers and our employees and the company in that order, customer, employee, and company. Um, and then also to learn and grow. And obviously you guys are all passionate about learning and growing because you're here at one of the best uh, educational institutions in the world. And it's something that is a big passion to us as well. We bring in guest speakers that are experts in different areas. We uh, have a training group and an organizational development group that does a lot of work to always try to make us better. And all of us are always seeking more knowledge and how to, and, and how to do that. So all those <coughs> uh, values support what is our core mission statement. And again, probably one you won't hear uh, elsewhere, but what our mission statement is, is that we're dedicated to creating the most epic entertainment experiences ever. And we do that by following some key foundational uh, tenets for Blizzard, and that is um, we hire only gamers. And uh, that seems obvious, but it's not something that is obvious to a lot of other companies. Uh, when you look at other big companies like EA or, or uh, Ubisoft or anything like that, they make awesome games. And they're able to do it because they have a lot of really, really solid gamers there. But I think for us, being a gamer is a critical component of actually having a job here. And that's because those gamers, those game developers at Blizzard, are actually the ones making the decisions at our company. In most companies, when people are making decisions as it relates to what products that they're going to deliver to the market, they do so by sitting at a board table. They have a sales guy in there. They have a, um, you know, a marketing guy. They have other executives in the company. And they sit around and they look at reports and they say, well, you know, there's a hole in the market here. We may want to take advantage of this opportunity. We really think that we can do something big there. And we will make that decision to do that type of product and to use this type of business model because we believe that's where we can really succeed. That's a really common thing that a lot of companies do. And a lot of the companies in our industry do it, for that matter. At Blizzard, it is the complete opposite. Now remember, I said we hire only gamers. And if you're on a game development team at Blizzard, you're going to be a hardcore gamer. Because we want you to be part of the demographic of people we're trying to sell to. We want you to come up with the idea for the game that you want to play next. And to build a game that you think your friends want to play next. Why is that important as part of that, that product development choice? Well, because when you are the one whose idea it is, I believe, you're going to be much more likely to put your blood, your sweat, and your tears into making sure it's great. And so <clears throat> that's one of the things that we do. We go to the development teams when they're finishing up a product and we say, what game do you want to make next? And we say, think about it and come back and tell us. And we, say, we tell them, don't worry about what the business model is. Don't worry about whether there's a hole in the market, whether it's a genre that, is, that we think is going to be successful or that we can capitalize in. Go think about what you want to play next. What's the next big thing for you? What motivates you? What games are you playing right now that you think you could take to an entirely different level? And so that's the way it works at Blizzard. And so they come to our leadership group, and we tell them to always come with two or three ideas. And I can tell you that other than only one time did we choose the second choice that they had, every other time it was always the number one choice. And what that has resulted in is a level of performance, and consistent performance for that matter, of big mega hits uh, in the PC marketplace that has been unmatched by any other company. Because those gamers, those developers, get to see their vision, their dream come true because they got the picket and we've supported them. We tell them, tell us how long it's going to take. Tell us how much money you think it's going to cost. We don't sit around in nickel and dime and we say, make sure it's the best game in the world. That's what's the requirement for us. If it's going to have the Blizzard brand on it, it is going to need to be the best one. And so that's what they do. And then when it comes to shipping the game, well, we only ship games when they're done. And what I mean by that is, is they've got to have that level of Blizzard polish, and they have to uh, be at a level of quality that is commensurate with what 
people in this audience and other gamers around the world expect when they see the Blizzard brand name on it. And <clears throat> a lot of other companies, our competitors, they suffer from a different challenge, and that is they suffer from trying to figure out how it is that they make their quarterly numbers. And while we are concerned about that because we are part of a public company, which is Activision Blizzard, we are focused on that. However, it's not the primary focus. And we at Blizzard have made the choice many, many times to slip a quarter, to slip a year, to miss the holiday season completely and totally because the game wasn't ready. And, you know, I don't think that there's really any other game company out there, and there's very few companies in any industry that are willing to do that. And it's because we've made this commitment to quality. Remember I talked about the values, commit to quality, gameplay first. Those are, dis those are values that influence all of our decisions every day at Blizzard. And we feel like the supporting of those values and the focus on that quality and making sure we're doing right by our customers has allowed us to see the success we have. We have a track record, I don't know if you guys know, that is really unmatched. We have 11 number one hits in a row. Every game since 1995 has been named Game of the Year that we've released. We have the three fastest selling PC games of all time. And I'm not saying that to brag about Blizzard's track record, I'm telling you because it's, it's a result of the fact that we've been uncompromising in those values and we've been uncompromising in making sure that the products we deliver are spectacular. If we mess up once and we breach that trust with the, the customers, then we never will have the opportunity again to sell 2.8 million copies in the first 24 hours of Wrath of the Lich King that you just saw up there. That happened last year and it broke the previous fastest selling game record which was the prior World of Warcraft expansion set, The Burning Crusade. And so I think <clears throat> it's something that you, you maybe don't think about, but it is something that we think about, and it's something that I think a lot of companies end up doing. They, they choose the short-term benefit over the long-term benefit. And for us, that does not happen we have to make sure that we're always betting on the long term because the companies that, in my opinion, that are built to last are the ones that think about the long term, not just the short. If you start making compromises to hit that quarter, you start eating away at the brand and the trust that is held in that brand. And if we did that, gamers around the world would not believe in Blizzard the way that I think that they do today. And it's something that I'm proud of. It's something that I think I've been part of helping to shape and it's something that I can't imagine being in a company, again, that doesn't view things that way. Um, and I, it's a luxury that we've built for ourselves, because not every company can do that, you know, because sometimes you just got to pay the bills. But our founders, when they, create, when, they, when they started this company, they started with $10,000. And even back then, they did everything that they possibly could to make sure that the product quality is there. When they were doing third-party development, you know, they would end up spending some of their profits to do more on those third-party products that were not going to bear their name because they put such a high value on the, th on the quality of product that they delivered. And it's something that carried on throughout the years as we became our own publisher and we had our own brand of Blizzard um, and we were doing products under that, <coughs> that brand. And so uh, that's something I'm really proud of. The other thing that I think is important to note that ties to that is, is that Blizzard, when we're creating those games, I talked about a moment ago that we, we tell the development teams, don't think about the business model when you're deciding what the game is. Right now, in our industry, one of the big business model uh, du jour um, is microtransactions. And there's a lot of companies, especially in Asia, that are seeing a lot of benefit uh, to their, to their uh, bottom line because of, those, of that business model. It's been something that's really been doing well for them. But, you know, for us, we've basically said microtransactions, they are cool and we could make a lot of money, but the types of games that we're developing are not appropriate for microtransactions because we think that the gameplay experience, if we were to attach that type of business model to it, would be deteriorated and the experience for the customers would be, would be lessened. And so what we do with the business model, again, it's something that's a little unorthodox. Most companies, when they're sitting in that boardroom and they're deciding the product, they're also deciding what the business model is that they want to use. Sometimes they're even talking about what the guesstimated pricing is. For us, 
we actually do it the opposite direction. It's, again, gameplay first. And then, once we're getting close to the release date of that product, we look at the markets we're going to release it in, we look at what the, uh, the, the local business models are, and we wrap the appropriate business model around the product. And by the way, that's hard, because sometimes you think to yourself, well, if I would have just made a couple of other decisions on the game, then this would have sure worked well with this business model. But that would be what everybody else does. For us, the answer is not, is not what everybody else does. It's to do what's right. And so we make sure that we're providing a business model that makes most sense for the game, also for the market. You know, I mentioned that we're, one of the, we're the world leader in online games. And when I say that, I don't mean that we're the world leader because we have the largest number in total. It's, although we do, um, <clears throat> it's that we have been able to be successful in a lot of different territories that no other game companies have been able to achieve. And as an example, you know, we, when you look at the World of Warcraft business, 45% of that business is in the West, meaning North America and Europe, and 55% is in the East. Blizzard is the only company, and this, this includes companies like Nintendo and Sony and Microsoft, that has actually been able to be successful not only in North America and Europe and be in a number one position, but also in Asia. Now maybe some of you are thinking about, wait a second, wait a second, Nintendo, Sony, they're big in Asia. They're big in Japan. And last time I checked when I looked at a map, Japan and Asia are not the same thing. Japan is in Asia. And so we actually have, are the number one game in China and Taiwan and Korea, etc. And the reason for that is, is because we've really tried to make sure that we created these games, the best games in the world, and that we made them feel local because we wrapped those business models around those great games. They want great games. Great games are great games. But oftentimes what makes people in other countries uh, able to step over that, uh, that line to make that decision is based upon it feeling like it was made for them. And so that's another thing that we really try to do is to customize our products to understand that what the culture is there and to culturalize them and to localize them and to build those business models around them so that it makes sense. And that's something I think is a key differentiator for us in allowing us to become a global company um, and to be, be really truly the only one in our industry that can say that. The other thing that um, I think uh, is a key differentiator for Blizzard is the Blizzard Polish, and um, we create strike teams. And those strike teams are cross-discipline teams that oversee um, the products towards the end and make sure that all of those things I've described are all being contemplated, that we're making sure that it, all the different pieces of the puzzle, that the service is fully integrated, that the, <coughs> um, the online components are fully integrated, and everything fits together. And so, anyway, um, I know I'm getting close to the time, and I want to give, I want to allow people to have uh, an opportunity for questions. But what I would tell you is, you know, kind of going back to it being about you, um, you guys are all, I'm sure, working towards finishing your degrees, and you're trying to figure out what it is exactly that you want to do with your life, and you're trying to figure out what the key things are that you need to do to make the right decisions uh, for yourself to have a bright future. Well, what I can tell you is you made one great choice already, and that is that you decided to come sc to school here. This is one of the best institutions around, and I can tell you that it was a big influence to me, and it's a place that I love very, very much, and was, uh, it has a lot of great memories for me. So you, you've made one spectacular decision for your future. But what I would tell you is, is that <clears throat> when you're going out into the job force to find a company that you love, you may want to be a f a, an accountant, you may want to be a finance guy. You may want to be a marketing person. And that's cool. Do that. But do it in a company where you use the product and you love the product and you believe that the, that the products that they create are ones that you can stand behind, that you're going to be proud to talk about when you're out with your friends. <clears throat> because, you know, doing yet another income statement or doing yet another statement of cash flows can kind of get tedious sometimes if you work in some place that you don't like. But if you're working some place that you do love and you do love the products, you can take that finance job and make it into a really exciting opportunity for you because you're doing your, your uh, craft in support of this great company that you love and these products that you love. And you can help give the business people and what have you all these incredible tools and information that you can generate to help them make the right decisions. 
and then you can go home every day and be proud of where you're working. So that's one thing. <clears throat> and then also, when you go into the, the job force, you guys are obviously really smart people. And don't allow that, that intelligence and your enthusiasm for because you have such a great degree from such a great institution cause you to be cocky when you walk in. One of the things that frustrates me with new hires and especially young ones is when they come in and they think they know everything. <clears throat> and they think that they have all the answers and especially that they think that there are things that they're being asked to do are beneath them. And I would tell you that if I would have taken that approach there is no chance in the world that I would have gotten into the role that I am today. And it's a really fun and cool role. And it's because I always said yes, again, provided it was appropriate and ethical. Um, but, it, <laughs> but I always said yes, that I was willing to do anything and everything necessary. And what that really means is, is no task was too small for me. If I need, and, and it works that way today. If my assistant says, if I say to my assistant, I need to send a FedEx, and she says that she's got to get something done. I say, no problem, I'll do it. I send my own faxes. I do all those things. And you might think, oh, the COO of this company is going to have somebody else doing all that crap for him. But honestly, you got to lead from the front. you got to not ask other people to do things you're not willing to do yourself. So never, ever, ever get into a job and say that you're unwilling to do something. Do whatever it takes. Work hard and put in huge amounts of time before you get married, because once you do... <laughs> you want to make sure you have a good work-life balance so you can spend that time with your kids and, and wife but, or husband. Um, and, uh, but, but while you have this time when you're single and you're trying to start up your career, really put forth all the energy that you possibly can. Be positive. Don't be a person, and I, I don't know if you'll want this on, on the tape, but don't be a shit stirrer. Somebody that complains all the time and causes problems. Because if you think about those people, those are never the people that ascend into the meaningful positions. It's always the people that are positive, that are willing to do all that it takes to get there. And so just want to say thank you again for having me today. And um, look forward to questions from all of you. And uh, again, ha thank you for having me. How important is a bachelor degree in a, working in a place like Blizzard? I think it's a, I, I think about um, labor economics when I was here. It's one of the few things I can remember. No, I'm kidding. Um, I think about signaling. And I think about how um, it's a signal to an employer that you can start a project, a big one, which is your undergraduate degree, and you can complete it. And so what it says to me when someone walks in with a degree is they have some level of, of intelligence presumably, um, and that they can do something big that they started and that they finished it. It's a good indication to me. Um, they obviously need to have the requisite capabilities to do the job. I want to make sure that when I look at them that I feel like they uh, will mesh well with our core values that I described. I also, especially today, am looking for key leadership traits in, in those new hires. And so they got to have all those things. And I also want to see a degree, for sure, for the vast majority of the positions. Some positions, I don't feel that it's as necessary, but the vast majority of the skilled positions, the ones that are going to make the most money, and I'm guessing you guys want to make a couple of dollars when you get older, um, those are the ones you need a degree. And the good news is, is you got a good school on your resume when you're done here. It'll help you. i got one more video for you if you want it. We forgot. One more if you want it. It's uh, the intro cinematic for what I believe will be Blizzard's best game. And it's my favorite. So <laughs> I thought uh, you might be interested to see it on a big screen. I don't know if you have before.
It's about time. <laughs> <laughs>